Hello, I'm on day five now of the fast and thank you to people who've been supporting in their own way. It's all much appreciated. So day six of the fast is going to be the dry fast, but I've actually started already. So I started the dry fast at 2 p.m. So I'm pretty much now almost into day six. And what I'm going to talk about now is just a little bit about how I've been feeling. So I was a little bit lethargic earlier, but then as soon as I start doing something, I'm completely fine and all of my attention goes on that task. I'm not, a, I don't get distracted that easily, but I have a tendency of a little bit of monkey minding sometimes and jumping around or getting distracted or trying to do more than one thing at once. Because of the energy situation in the body, it wants to be as conservative as possible. So that's why I think my focus is so good. It just doesn't have the mental energy to create unwanted mental distractions which is a benefit but I have to actually start that the motivation to start I have to force myself and once I'm started I'm completely fine in terms of physical energy I wouldn't really want to go and do a big workout right now or go for a long walk but I can potter around perfectly happily doing my own thing I'm going to talk a little bit about insulin now because it relates into the dry fasting which I have to make a separate video for that because it's, it's complicated in theory but it practically it's actually quite simple and also the idea of receptors and molecules is important for addiction which I'll talk about a little bit as well. So in the body there's lots of there's lots of receptors so that we can pretend that they are like a docking point or a or a lock and each of these locks has keys which can go in which can be hormones or neurotransmitters or uh, proteins but then outside things like drugs and plant products and such like so when the receptor gets activated it makes the cell do something so it, it's different it depends on the cell so it might open an iron channel so that ions can flow in because cells have got a, an electric charge of minus 20 millivolts and there's this constant flux of ions going in and out. Also, the other thing that can happen is it can make another molecule get made or it can switch genes on. There are lots of different things. The, the receptors are sort of like the eyes of the cell so it can understand and know what's going on in the rest of the body and integrate with all of that. So insulin has its own receptor and when the insulin binds, something happens. So first of all, insulin gets made from beta cells in the pancreas when blood sugar levels have been raised so that can be through stress but most of the time it's from eating particularly foods that are high in carbohydrates and sugar so when the blood sugar rises uh, the insulin comes out and it binds to its receptor and the next thing that happens is the glucose transporters come up to the cell surface and there are different kinds and it's like a door and the glucose goes in to the cell and the level of the blood sugar goes down Insulin also is a storage hormone and a growth hormone, so it has other functions as well, but its main function is lowering uh, blood sugar. And insulin, when insulin's high, the body's in anabolic or building mode, and when insulin is low, the body's in catabolic mode. It has other um, hormones which do the opposite, which raise blood sugar, like glucagon is the main one, but adrenaline and cortisol can raise blood sugar as well. But glucagon is the main partner to insulin. So when glucagon is high, insulin is low, and that's again a sign of the body being in a catabolic or energy using stage or phase. So when it comes to insulin resistance, what that means is, is the cells are ignoring the insulin and the sugar is staying in the blood so there are different reasons why this happens it's not just at the level of the insulin receptor when it comes to things like insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes the cells have already got plenty of energy in them so they don't want any more glucose it's like trying to get on a bus that's already full so you can try and get on but you can't because it's already full of people so that's one reason why insulin resistance happens so in order to try and overcome this, the pancreas makes more and more and more and more insulin to try and get the blood sugar down. And eventually there comes a point when all the cells are full, the pancreas is exhausted, and then that's when blood sugar levels become high. So that would be over six in millimoles per litre. 
and that's sort of the beginning of type 2 diabetes. It can go way higher than that, but what the point of that this is, is that the type 2 diabetes starts years and years and years before you actually get the high blood sugar. That's kind of the end of the line, per se. And insulin resistance just means that the, the body has become intolerant or unable to process sugar properly. And like I've said in one of my earlier slides, muscle mass or muscle and, and uh, the liver are the main sinks or the places that the, the, the glucose can go. Another thing people might have heard of is fatty liver. So that's another situation where there's so much energy and glucose trying to come in that the liver starts to make fat out of this glucose. So that's again another hallmark of of type 2 diabetes. A fatty liver and type 2 diabetes usually come together. So really what type 2 diabetes is, it's not anything to do with high blood sugar per se. It's too much sugar in the whole body to the point where the pancreas can't cope anymore. So the solution would be to use up or get rid of the sugar that's in the body because otherwise if you start to add insulin from the outside to a type 2 diabetic, you're trying to force all this sugar into cells that don't even want it. So that's when you end up with real trouble because uh, you can get sort of infections in places and it damages the organs when all this sugar gets forced in. In the post that I wrote, I did write some things down to, to help with insulin resistance. Also fat of course can store uh, glucose as well and this is why thin people can get type 2 diabetes too because we've got a genetic predisposition to how good we are at splitting fat cells. So some people can make loads and loads of fat cells like having uh, loads and loads of storage or a massive suitcase or lots of suitcases and they can make huge amounts of these so that the uh, glucose has got somewhere to be stored. Other people are not very good at splitting fat cells, so all the fat cells get full as well. So for these people, they're not, they don't look particularly overweight, but all, everything's full in the body. There's no room even in the fat, so they could become type 2 diabetic as well. And as I uh, alluded to earlier, type 2 diabetes is reversible. There's lots of anecdotal evidence, evidence in the literature about this. And again, it's something if you're interested in, either get in touch or look into it yourself. So back to receptors and um, addiction. So being a biochemist, I try to look at the biochemical side as well of everything, but of course there's psychological sides to addictions. And for, from a psychological point of view, a lot of unusual behaviors, whether from ranging from addictions to all kinds of other things, are just a coping mechanism the body has for another problem. However, there are lots of things which are biochemically addic addictive. In my personal view of addiction, I would say nicotine is the most addictive substance I've ever come across in my entire life more addictive than anything else. However, we'll just think about dopamine for now. So with dopamine, it has its receptors as well. So when we do something pleasurable, whether it's doing extreme sports, eating food, eating junk food, eating sugar, watching pornography, uh, shopping, gambling, taking cocaine, having sex, whatever it is, dopamine gets produced and it binds to its receptor and we get this feeling of pleasure and because dopamine is also involved in learning and motivation, unfortunately, the body then learns what the pleasurable experience was and then motivates you to seek out more of it. So this is perfectly normal when it's under control. But like insulin receptors, dopamine receptors can start to uh, get down-regulated when they sort of go back and hide in the cell or desensitize is another thing which happens, which means you need more and more and more dopamine to get the same effect. So this obviously can uh, it manifest itself as addiction, but also it can manifest itself as everything just being so boring and, and people are boring, everything's boring, it's just so boring and you're always constantly seeking out new stimulations, new exciting things to do. And there is something called a dopamine fast, which what you do is you uh, take away all stimulus. So I had a go at this one day, so I went in my room for all day and all night with no stimulus and in the dark just to try and dampen down this this process to encourage the dopamine receptors to start to, to come back again so that I could get enjoyment out of simple and normal things again. There are obviously of course social media uh, fasts as well because social media is a dopamine flooding experience as well because of likes and following and such like. So people sometimes do a social media fast. So how does this relate into, into fasting? 
Well, like anything, if you ha have abstinence from something, then the, the systems in the body, the receptors and such like, will sort of repopulate the, the cell surface but in a more sensible way so that you need less of this particular neurotransmitter to get the same effect. From a psychological point of view, of course, there's the habit side and associations and uh, such like. When it comes to food, I've used fasting really successfully for certain food addictions. So the latest one was the cheese addiction, which people who know me know that I'm obsessed with cheese. Well, I was. I don't have it. I haven't had cheese for ages. In cheese, there's there's something called casein, and this can get converted into caseinomorphines. And as soon as you like hear the word morphine, you know it's probably going to be something pleasurable and addictive. So the way I overcome my cheese addiction was I did uh, two 48-hour fasts with a break in between. I meant to do a 72-hour, but then I just gave up uh, and then decided to do another fast pretty shortly afterwards. And, and since then, I haven't eaten any cheese. I haven't even wanted any or wanted to buy any. So again, fasting is really useful, even in the short term like that, for overcoming food addictions. And there are certain foods that are just more addictive than others, like bread is one of them, uh, sugar, um, processed food, uh, stuff like that. But it, what I was impressed with is how quickly the food addiction goes. And that's why lots of people who get into fasting, they do a 72 hour fast first or 248 back to back in order to get rid of these food addictions because so to, the, to somebody who really loves stuff like that the idea of giving it up forever is, is traumatic but it, the cravings just go really quickly so that's why people get into fasting but also they, it's very sustainable because you don't actually want these foods anymore either so a while back uh, maybe a year ago I was really into dark chocolate and nuts so I used the same process to stop uh, eating those and I haven't eaten any nuts really since now, nuts are a funny one because you think, oh, well, you know, they're healthy. They've got all these useful things in them, but they've got something called lectins in them as well, which do strange things to the insulin receptor. So in a way, it's almost like having sugar. And I've always wondered why nuts are so addictive and Moorish. So, well, now I know. It doesn't mean you can't have any of these things because addiction and just having something as a treat is, is a two totally different things. Even people that use drugs, I have plenty of friends that every now and again they'll use something but they're not addicted, it's just a bit of fun. However, the one thing, like I said before, that you just can't do that with is nicotine. One puff or one nicotine chewing gum and boom, the whole process starts again. I just think it really is the all or nothing. Anyway, I hope you found this useful and the next video is going to be about dry fasting, which is having no liquid. And once again, thank you for your support and goodbye.